The, uh, thank you so much for, for coming to this town hall. We've used these forums in the past to share information about specific issues or broad issues. Um, today is, is a somewhat specific discussion and we're focusing on the federal vaccine mandate. We know that there are a lot of questions. You've seen two uh, presidential messages come out about uh, the scope or the unknown scope of the impact of the federal vaccine mandate on us. And um, just to rewind a little bit, we had the presidential executive order, which said federal contractors would be subject to a vaccine mandate. Um, and later, later in the month of September, we received clarification from the uh, task force. It was called the Safer Task Force. Um, and uh, there they laid out specific rules, still with, with some uncertainty, um, but it was a lot more specific than the presidential executive order. It gave us some information to work with. And uh, later in November, they would clarify some of, of their original guidance. Uh, the original guidance had a vaccination date for those required to vaccinate of um, 8 December, and they've since moved that to, to January 18th, among some other changes. Um, changes to what happens if somebody um, uh, doesn't vaccinate um, and, uh, and doesn't qualify for one of the exemptions. What, how does that process play out? So there was some additional flexibility that the federal government um, offered as well. Uh, we also saw um, a number of lawsuits uh, on a variety of the mandates. So there were several mandates. The one we've been watching closely is, uh, is the federal contractor mandate. We, we have about $108 million. This is an estimate that it fluctuates, but uh, $108 million, $110 million of total federal contracts um, at UND. So we qualify as a federal contractor. Um, in addition, uh, there are other, there was uh, one that was for employees with 100 or more, uh, and that was being directed by OSHA. Um, OSHA would later pull back that requirement. And then the third element that we've been watching, of course, is the one that deals with the Medicare and Medicaid recipients, uh, who, which organizations uh, work with that money. And, uh, and, uh, and we also saw uh, recently an injunction there um, uh, that, uh, that put a hold on that one. Um, in addition, and I think Charlie Gorecki will probably give us some more information when, when he, he steps up to the podium, um, but there's another, there's a Kentucky law case uh, lawsuit um, that touches the federal contractor um, requirement as well. And uh, it argues um, against uh, issuing such a mandate. My point in bringing up this spaghetti mess of legal issues and, uh, and guidance is that there's a lot of uncertainty. So our approach at UND has been to take a cautious approach in terms of rolling out the mandate. Um, we did not come out and say every employee on campus is required uh, to vaccinate just because we don't, uh, we don't yet know the full scope, um, but we will make certain that um, whatever is required to comply with the federal mandate, uh, we will, uh, or if, if the law, if, if the, um, the lawyers, if the courts come back and, and uh, put restrictions or eliminate the mandate, we'll pay close attention to that as well. Um, consequently, I'm very pleased with the approach this group uh, that's meeting with you today has taken in terms of, of how, we've, how we moved forward, a uh, very patient, cautious approach. Uh, we have two contracts that are, um, will soon be signed. Um, and uh, one is with Lidos, it's with the EERC, and another is with our Research Institute for Autonomous Systems. Uh, it's a contract with a company called ARA. Um, our leaders and I have actually spoken with, with their leadership to understand what parameters they're looking at, how they're gonna judge compliance and so forth. And those conversations have actually reinforced, um, I, I think the appropriateness of the approach that we're taking, um, which is identify those who are connected to that work and then require vaccinations. We haven't signed those contracts yet, which is why nobody on campus has been notified. Um, uh, but I would suspect that uh, we're still a week away from the earliest possible notifications on campus, simply because we haven't signed those contracts and we're watching another court case that we're anticipating uh, to close out on December 8th or to get some information on December 8th. Um, that's enough of the high level stuff for me, perhaps more detail than you needed to know, but I just wanted to paint the picture that there's a lot of uncertainty and I'm really proud of the team um, that will speak today um, and the approach that, uh, that we've decided to take for our campus. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to um, our pandemic lead uh, who has been doing just remarkable work since he's been in the seat uh, and that's uh, Vice President uh, Jed Shivers. Jed, over to you. Okay, well, hi all. Um, you know, uh, so glad that so many of you are participating in the town hall. 
Uh, I do want to just take a second and step back and just kind of review where we've been. So uh, I think we've been doing this now for about 20 months. And uh, we went through a nice trough period this last summer as we did the prior summer. But I think there are a couple of things that we do want to talk a little, touch on a little bit in terms of public health and the safety of our campus before we get going with specific questions. And I'll tell you, I'm going to be thrilled if I'm wrong, but let me just sort of give you my perspective on this. And also, you know, what we're seeing from the data when we meet on our Tuesday and Thursday pandemic meetings. So unfortunately, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, our hospital system being fairly stressed at this time with COVID. Uh, we are seeing, you know, transmission rates remaining fairly high. So they are steadily within the 250-ish range, uh, according to the CDC, per 100,000. And that's five times more than the, uh, you know, the level by which you can start to relax and say, for example, consider removing mask mandates and things like that. So we're not at a place where, you know, we can kind of say, hey, you know, we're seeing the end of this. And of course, we're all reading about Omicron, the latest, you know, variant and whether or not it's more or less dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the key message here is if you just think about this, you know, from a sort of common sense basis, a lot of us have gotten vaccinated, but not enough of us. I think that's probably fair to say. It's unknown whether those people who have acquired their immunity naturally still have that immunity if they haven't been vaccinated uh, because they may have gotten sick quite some time ago. And as we know, immunity tends to fade. So I would say the message from the campus is to really, we need to continue what we're doing. We would urge you, in spite of how we're responding to the vaccine mandate, if you haven't been vaccinated, please do get vaccinated. It's not a, you know, this is, this is us encouraging you to do this. If you have been vaccinated, you haven't gotten your booster and you're eligible, get boosted. And we would say, if you're in a public place where you're crowded with other people, masks are a good idea. I hate it, I don't like it. Every time I leave my office and I walk down the hall, I'm wearing my mask. So it's just something that I do. I think it's not just because it's, it's, it's the right thing for me as well as the right thing for the institution. So just wanted to lay that, lay that out there. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in the coming months, I hope I'm wrong, but I do think things are gonna get a bit worse. That is to say, I think we'll see higher transmission rates. Uh, I think we'll see uh, greater pressure on the hospital system because we're going into winter months where people are more crowded together. And the only way we're gonna blunt that is with vaccination and mask wearing. So please do keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanna do is just touch base with Charlie Gorecki and uh, CEO of the EERC. Uh, and he thought, he I think he might be able to shed just a little bit of light on uh, the court case that may, uh, which is creating some additional uncertainty on the uh, vaccine mandate for federal contractors, which of course, as we know, is where we're being affected by most. So Charlie, would you like to comment on that? Just kind of like where we are at the moment. Yeah, thank you, Vice President Shivers. As President Armacost already stated, there are three prongs of the federal vaccine mandate. The one was the OSHA portion of the vaccine mandate. The second part, is related to the federal contractors. And the third part is with respect to Medicare and Medicaid recipients. Two of those three prongs, the OSHA prong and the Medicare Medicaid prong in court have already received injunctions and a stay until they can be heard in court. With respect to the federal contractor piece, as President Armacross pointed out, there are multiple cases from multiple states that are challenging that in court. One of those was recently heard this week in Kentucky uh, this applies specifically to Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. And I think it's worth just reading the first paragraph uh, so you understand what the court's view is on this. And it kind of gives you a sense of where we'll likely end up with respect to the North Dakota case and then how this mandate might affect uh, the University of North Dakota with respect to federal contractor status. So it reads, this is not a case about whether vaccines are effective. They are. This, nor is this a case about whether the government at some level in some circumstances can require citizens to obtain vaccines. It can. The question presented here is narrow. Can the president use congressionally delegated authority to manage the federal procurement of goods and services 
to impose vaccines on the employees of federal contractors and subcontractors? In all likelihood, the answer to that question is no. So for this reason, for the reasons that follow, the pending request for a preliminary injunction will be granted. It goes on to cite 20 pages or so of federal case law uh, with respect to why that is likely, um, that why they granted the injunction it will likely then be heard in court. So there's a stay on that executive order for those three states. And so likely the case that will be heard in Missouri is where the North Dakota case uh, is going to be heard, will also receive an injunction. It's expected on or before December 7th, December 8th. That's why President Armacost indicated that the earliest we would likely sign those contracts is that date. So we have been looking at the specific language on those contracts, the modification, how it references the executive order, uh, and then working with uh, the Attorney General's office uh, that represents the University of North Dakota to make sure that if we sign these contracts, and there's an injunction just to make sure that the university isn't forced into complying with a mandate if one isn't required per the contract, if there's an injunction. I hope that helps provide a little clarity as well. So again, December 7th or 8th, I, as what I've heard, a court case will be heard related to the North Dakota lawsuit. And I think the point here is it's a very fluid dynamic situation. And uh, you know, so so I guess the bottom line is that if people are expecting to hear, okay, well, the mask, you know, the vaccine mandate begins and these are the people that are subject to it or the campus is subject to it, as you've seen in our sister school, North Dakota State, not gonna happen today. I mean, it's just, this is not the moment uh, for us to move forward with that. But we do, but I think it is very worthwhile for people to understand, uh, you know, and, and they have questions about what things would be like with a mask mandate, uh, sorry, a vaccine mandate were to be implemented, which I think in some form it's likely to be in some way or another. So let's start to move on to some questions along those lines, if we may. And we're going to start with one, and I'm going to address this one to our CIO, Madhavi Marasinghe. And uh, here, Madhavi, the question is, how will UND guarantee our medical privacy during this mandate? So the basic idea is, uh, you know, we're going to go... Uh, for those people right now, the way this is going to work is that um, if an area or a certain set of people uh, are involved in a specific contract and that contract gets signed, okay, I'm just trying to going to set the stage here, then those people will receive notification from the university via the Office of Human Resources where they are now people who are subject to the vaccine mandate. Now this assumes that the court, you know, injunction is unsuccessful, et cetera, et cetera. So keep in mind, there's still much uncertainty there, right? And in addition, there will be offices who, when that first contract is signed, I would say my office, president's office, you know, parts of human resources, almost all of public safety, et cetera. Those areas will also be uh, part of the mandate because any reasonable person would say that they're directly contributing to the efforts associated with those particular contracts. But vast portions of the university won't be implicated, right? So unless student employees, for example, are uh, part of a specific contract, they will not be implicated. And other areas of the university, not part of this contract, not clearly supporting the effort of this of these specific contracts won't be implicated now as more of these contracts get signed and the vaccine mandate remains more of the university will be implicated just as a matter of course so that's really the approach that we're planning on taking if the, ma the vaccine mandate prevails and so now the question is okay well how does this thing really work so the basic idea here is what we're trying to do is have people say yep you can go ahead and get my vaccination status rather than forcing people initially to upload proof of vaccination status. So now, sorry for that lengthy preoration, but Madhavi, if you could talk about how that process works and then, um, you know, how is it that we're guaranteeing privacy? Thank you, Bibi Shivas. So yes, so just like Jed said, we do have a website that uh, we have been working on to um, uh, allow you to upload your card. 
uh, the vaccine card, a photocopy of your card, or uh, let us know whether you have been vaccinated. So if you are from, if you got vaccinated from North Dakota or Minnesota, you do not need to upload your card because our health uh, uh, staff would have that information. Uh, they can get that information from the state. But if you got your vaccination from any other state, you would need to upload your card. So the way we make sure that uh, the records are kept private is we actually uh, looked at the HIPAA requirements and uh, added several layers of security. It's not just one layer. So one, for example, uh, you have to log in and you have to multi-factor and the data from end to end is encrypted. Uh, and also once we have the data in our system, we don't keep the records like, like the photocopy of your uh, uh, COVID card for more than two days in our systems. So that's to make sure that our staff, the health staff has the, uh, enough time to verify that the card is correct. And then we remove access to that card from the back end. So the people who have access to uh, your records are only the health people. Now let's, I think there, this is a good moment and I'm gonna ask uh, Associate VP Peggy Barber for Human Resources to also comment on this. I think this is a good moment for people to understand. It's actually in this, in, with, with regard to the vaccine mandate, I'm gonna say it's really not our business to know whether or not people are vaccinated or not vaccinated. What is our business if we're operating under the mandate is to know whether or not people are complying with the mandate, right? And you can comply with the mandate by saying, yes, you can check my vaccination status and you'll get it and you'll know, right? Or you can go through one of the exemption processes. So it's just, we are not, we're, we're just looking for whether or not people who are affected by this, assuming it goes through and continues, are actually in compliance. The actual result, I would say, not my business, not the university's business, is a question of compliance using one of these three pathways. So Peggy, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's been raised as a concern about who's going to know if I've yep. been vaccinated or not. You bet. Thank you. So as for, uh, we've gotten that question come up in the chat, we've answered it a couple of different times, hopefully. Um, but basically, the uh, supervisor won't know how a person complies. So whether they've received the vaccination, whether they've received an exception, they won't know. So um, so my supervisor is Jed. Jed won't know if I complied by getting vaccinated or by uh, requesting exception and having that being granted. He will only know that I've complied with the mandate. And the mandate has two different ways, right? It says you have to be vaccinated or you have to be granted an exception under religious. Within the religious or medical process, we had this question come up too. So I'll just go ahead and um, go down that road here. Um, the question is, how is that treated? How is that managed? And depending on um, the information and, and, and which, um, whether you're looking at religious or medical, there's either a person or two people, or there's a committee that reviews it. And when, it, when multiple people being two or a committee review it, the name is removed. So the committee does not know who they're looking at. They only know basically what the request is. So the request is to not get vaccinated. Here's my information. If it's medical information, it's fairly easy. We look at what the uh, provider um, uh, responds with, and then we make that decision. With the religious, there's a little bit more information, but again, reviewed and um, uh, you know processed that way. But it, but again, if there's multiple people that are on the committee, three people, they don't know who it is that they're reviewing. They just look at the information that's provided, um, and any information within that request form or information that the response it, that would identify a person is redacted. So we do the best that we can to really leave the person out of it. Um, and then again, there's just a handful of people who will know um, more specifics in terms of what comes out of the vaccination portal um, that's verified. Um, and again, you know, Madhavi's group and UIT has done a great job um, with the IT side of things of, of protecting the, the, the information to the best extent possible. Thanks, Peggy. Sure. Uh, an another question, which is actually one that we talked about uh, at our morning pandemic, and we'll talk about again at one, is, is there a place for those of us who would like to volunteer to be preemptively upload our COVID vaccine record into the uh, UND system 
to prevent any technology overload if and when a mandate goes into place? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I actually really appreciate the question because I think people are thinking, hey, you know, if we start to provide this information now, there won't be a rush and so on and so forth. We'll talk about that uh, more at, uh, at our pandemic meeting in about 40 minutes or so and work through, you know, what the process is and so on and so forth. But it, I think the key thing it would be strictly voluntary, right? And the question for Madhavi would be, you know, again, now you're getting into, well, how long does that data get held for? Because if you're not currently implicated in the mandate, uh, you know, but you could be like weeks from now, for example, that means you might not, you might need to have that data for weeks so that when, you know, that person becomes, you know, someone who we have to say, hey, are they in compliance? You know, or it, it, does the data still reside? So I think we got to work through those questions first. Madhavi, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so the way we have set it up is that uh, we remove the card after two days, after being verified but we do have the record in our systems, but it's again uh, encrypted. The only people who will have access to is the health professionals uh, at UND. Yeah, so anyway, more to come on that. Really good question, really appreciate that. Um, we've got a question which I'm going to uh, turn to uh, ask for commentary, both from uh, President Armacost, interim President Helwig, of uh, Student Affairs and uh, Provost Link. Um, question is, do we have the freedom to tell students, faculty, staff to wear masks if we see people not wearing them in the hallways and buildings around campus? This is a question that has really come up very frequently in our pandemic meetings. It's a tough one. It's where people are using their judgment, uh, you know, about, you know, what's, what seems to be a problem, what seems to be not a problem. Uh, President Armacost, would you like to start this one off? Sure, the answer is yes. Um, and I would ask that you do it um, with the sense of, of respect to other people as well. They're, if they're not wearing a mask, they might've just um, become a little careless. I would say absolutely approach them and ask, ask them kindly to put it back on. Over to our other two vice presidents, Eric and Beth. I, I can go ahead and go. Uh, we did talk about it this morning. It's very difficult when you see uh, large groups of students in particular, for instance, in the Memorial Union who are not wearing masks. And uh, I do agree that we should feel very free to be able to talk to students or faculty and staff and ask them politely, remind them. Uh, and I think we also have to demonstrate our own commitment to wearing masks. Um, and, and that would be very helpful as well. So yes, I totally support us uh, talking with people about wearing their masks. And I'll just jump in at this point and reiterate what my colleagues have already said. Uh, yes, indeed, please feel free to uh, positively encourage um, good health and safety practice on this campus when you see it. Uh, the only additional uh, comment I'll add is that our, our basic approach to this uh, throughout has been one of positive encouragement, positive counseling uh, in a non-confrontational manner, right? We don't want to, for the sake of health and safety, uh, turn uh, a, uh, a, a moment of positive counseling into a moment of confrontation that becomes uh, not in everyone's best interest in terms of health and safety on this campus. Thank you. Uh, another quick question, which we sort of answered, but I think it's worth, uh, you know, just making sure people, you know, are re reiterating is, uh, I heard that NDSU is going to require vaccination regardless of the stay for contractors. Will UND follow suit? President Armacost, would you like to address that for a minute? Yeah, so um, I don't know that that statement is accurate. Um, I saw President Bershani yesterday in a meeting. He was unaware of of the recent uh, court case that uh, Charlie Gorecki just cited. Um, and uh, he seemed, uh, he was listening with great care uh, when I told him about this and that we needed to pay attention to what the federal courts tell us. Um, I think that if the courts, um, and if I understand the question correctly is if we'll still do it in spite of any court injunction, right? And I, my plan is if, if the courts um, do not, uh, if the courts uh, turn over the, the federal mandate, um, then we will not be under a federal mandate. And, um, and so our efforts will, will be put on hold until we get firm resolution. Thank you. 
Uh, this is a question that I know came up with the at the EERC. In the event of vaccination does become required, will UND be held liable to compensate employees who are injured by the vaccine? And uh, we've actually checked with state risk management on that topic. The answer is no. Uh, will booster shots be mandated or just initial vaccinations? Uh, so I think the answer there is uh, right now the government is defining a person who's been vaccinated as a person who's been fully vaccinated with either one J and J or uh, the two shot uh, course of either Moderna or Pfizer. Jess, is that about right? Jess Doty, Director of Student Health. Yeah, thanks, Jed. Um, yes, that is correct. At this time, the initial or your primary series is what is considered being fully vaccinated at this point, and the booster is recommended, but not a part of your initial series. Thank you. Uh, if you require the vaccine and you do not want it, will I be terminated? If employees would need to do it, why not the students? So I think the answer here is uh, first of all, we'll see whether or not vaccines are required. Uh, secondly, uh, people have two pathways to exempt themselves that are legitimate within the federal framework if it is required uh, to exempt themselves from uh, vaccination. And uh, ABP Varberg outlined those. There's a religious pathway and there's a medical pathway. And uh, both are absolutely legitimate pathways for exemption. Uh, if and when we get to the point where a person chooses not to take either of those pathways and isn't complying, then I think we go through a process of really working with that person and saying, hey, you know, do you understand what the issue is? You know, uh, you know, wh where are you? What are your concerns about this, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say here is there's no like hard and fast you know, bang, and this we've actually written about this, so you can consult what's already been written and talked about. There's no hard and fast, you know, line that gets drawn that says, hey, you're terminated. But if we're into this thing and it continues and there's no stay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and people ch choose to not go through these pathways and they're implicated, right? Because you may or may not be part of the group that is, uh, you know, needs to, that falls under the vaccine mandate, then, uh, you know, we work with you and the, uh, the possibility of progressive discipline certainly exists. Peggy, do you want to, anything you want to add to that? No, um, I think you've done well. We, we, you know, our, um, our disciplinary process is one where we really encourage and work with, with employees and supervisors anyway. And they're gen it's generally not a process that we take. Obviously we never take it lightly and we don't try to go too quick, uh, to a quick end in any case, in this case, the same. Um, we'll work with the employee. We'll make sure that um, they understand the expectations, ask any questions they might have still of the mandate and what's being asked of them. Um, and additionally, make sure that they have, um, you know, a lot of information to discover more information about the vaccination, encourage them to speak with their, um, their primary care physician um, or provider, those kinds of things, and really walk down that path about expectations and, um, you know, really make every effort to, to help the employee, um, the decision that works best for them. Thank you, Peggy. So again, uh, not to be a broken record, but I think it's very important to just keep in mind, if you're sort of on the verge of saying, well, I'm out of here because I'm not mm -hmm. doing this, don't do it yet because we yes. don't even know whether or not we're gonna be subject to the mandate as you've heard. So again, part of what we're trying to say here is we got a ways to go before we really discover uh, whether or not a we're going to be subject, and then you know how this really will play out. So uh, just a just a kind of overview on that question. Um, next question. Uh, oh, uh, so here is uh, how will we determine uh, who is subject to the mandate? So again, this is about people who are directly involved in the specific contracts, and and we actually know uh, we can tell. Uh, by either the people who are directly supervising those contracts and or who is being paid by those contracts, uh, who are involved in those contracts, who's committing effort to those contracts. And it's the same kind of system. So if in the unlikely event, the federal government ever came by and said, okay, well, show me 
uh, what, how you made the determination of who was working on what contracts, we could do it. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind here. So that's part of the process. The other part of the process, which are those offices that are indirectly supportive, but clearly supportive, the criteria we, we use is what would a reasonable external observer think is sort of logically, you know, what offices are logically involved? Uh, and, and so we've kind of applied those criteria and shared them with the respective vice presidents. So they have a pretty good idea, and directors and CEOs. They have a pretty good idea of uh, who, who all would be involved once that first contract is signed. Okay. Um, a question for, I think, Peggy, it sounds like UND already has access to faculty COVID vaccination records. If vaccination was done in North Dakota or Minnesota, does UND also have access to other faculty healthcare info? Yeah, nope. <laughs> no, um, we don't. And I think um, Jess, probably Jess Doty can help um, share with this answer, but we don't currently have access to any of that information. And um, just a reminder that if you become a person who is required to get vaccinated, you've done so, you're able to um, upload that information to the vaccination portal. There is a question in there that asks you, are you okay with this? Do you, do you agree that we can check this information out? And Jess, I don't know if you have more information on the other side, if, if essentially we just get a, a, you know, a note back from North Dakota, Minnesota, whatever, public, Department of Public Health that just basically says, yes, we verified the information they gave. Um, but as far as other medical information for faculty and staff, uh, we don't have access to that. I can just add, Peggy, that um, the verification is with the North Dakota Immunization Registry, so the access is only verifying immunization. Um, no other healthcare information is shared um, or accessible. It would be only immunization information. Okay, thank you. So another question, which I think is a really nice one, is uh, will there be a requirement for testing of, um, uh, if, of employees who are not vaccinated? So if I think in the OSHA regs, uh, there's kind of an out, right? You can, if, you, if you're getting tested like twice a week or something like that, and you can show that you're negative, blah, 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 you know, you can continue and you don't, you're not subject to the mandate. Federal contracts, as far as we can tell at this time, do not allow us to have that option. It simply does not appear to be there. So unless we hear differently or learn differently at this point, we should assume that the sort of test out option, I'll call it, does not exist. But if further uh, you know, information suggests that it's available, we can more than, you know, obviously that's something that we would look at. Uh, it's not an easy logistical task to pull off, but I think you know, depending upon the numbers, we would do our very best to accommodate people. But again, at this point, we do not believe it's an option. Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, I've got a question on the religious exemption, and I think our religious exemption expert, Peggy can definitely answer, but I think our religious ex uh, exemption expert will be coming on shortly. So I'm going to hold on that one for now. And um, I see a few more items on religious exemption. Um, will student employees be part of the mandate? Uh, again, at this time, the only student employees that are part of the mandate will be those who are definitely absolutely working directly on those specific contracts or in the unlikely event are student employees who are part of the offices that are uh, indirectly supporting that number I think is going to be pretty uh, very small so uh, it's really going to be limited to people who are directly working on contracts um, question for Peggy how will supervisors deal with people sharing offices? What if I'm reluctant to share an office space with a coworker who is compliant but not vaccinated? Do I have a choice? Interesting question. We're kind of getting beyond the, this is sort of a current activities of daily living question that we deal with right now. So what, what do we do right now? We do, yeah. And so that's, you know, that's something that uh, individual areas work with. So I don't have an like overall answer. Um, my first comment would be, I'm not sure that you may always know. Um, we don't ask, we're not, we don't really, some people are very open about whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, some people are not open to giving either answer um, or discuss it. And so there may be people that we currently work with now that are not vaccinated and we're not aware of it. 
Um, so I think um, you know, if, if people are willing to say I'm not vaccinated and a person who is vaccinated is uncomfortable with that, I think they need to work with their leadership in their area to discover how they can uh, manage that. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, question for Bill Chaves. You thought you were going to get away with not talking. Uh, why are masks not required at campus events like hockey games? Yeah, good question, Jed. So a number of our sports play uh, indoors in uh, non-university owned facilities. Uh, they include hockey, basketball, volleyball, football, men's and women's tennis at choice. Uh, so we adhere to the uh, facilities protocols. And currently those facilities do not have mandates. They're encouraged, but not mandated. Thank you. Um, if we do, here's a question. If we do not get an exemption, how long will we have to get vaccinated after that point? Will we only get the exemption forms once notified of needing to get vaccinated or is something, or is there something we can already start filling out already to be prepared? Peggy, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Again, the same with the vaccination portal. I think these processes are ready to go. And so I think we'll have a discussion um, at the pandemic EC meeting here shortly and, uh, and uh, you know, get permission or not to open those portals, open up that process um, and uh, get that moving. They, the, they're just not live on a website somewhere. And I think that's the key. They're live and they're available, but they're just not, you know, ready to go, but they're just not live on a website. Um, and so I think that if, if a decision is made to do that um, out of the EC meeting later, um, we absolutely will send a communication out to say, here's where you go and feel free to do this if you choose. Thank you. Uh, let me just, I'm um, just working through the next set of questions here because I think we've answered a number of them. Uh, here's an interesting question. Again, this is more activities of daily living. Um, can we please post a full-time person in our building to remind people to wear masks, faculty, students, and staff freely and continuously stroll through corridors without masks? Also, classes are run with most students and some faculty not wearing masks. Mandate is not useful if there is not compliance. Uh, President Armacost, do you want to comment on that for a minute? Yeah, anything we can do to increase compliance is a good thing. So signage um, would be a welcome addition, I think, to the measures that are already in place. If uh, faculty members are um, holding classes where students um, are not wearing masks, that, that's a problem and uh, inconsistent with, uh, with the expectations of the campus. And uh, again, the, the, the real re one of the main reasons for having the mask mandate in class is that if um, if somebody does uh, come down with COVID and they're close contacts with people, unvaccinated people um, who are not wearing masks, um, everybody has to be uh, quarantined uh, in, that, in that circle. Um, it's important that the mask mandate is important because it allows us to keep the, the courses running uh, without this major disruption due to large quarantines in the case of somebody uh, coming down with the virus. So, um, so this is why we need to keep going. And, uh, if we do see those problems, please address that with the faculty member, um, address it um, in, a, again, a friendly professional way. Um, but if not, uh, you can speak with uh, the department chair, um, the dean, or even the provost. Provost Link, anything to add there? Uh, nothing to add, just to underscore the central message that anything we can do to promote um, our compliance with the current guidelines is certainly appreciated. Uh, yes, we receive uh, reports on occasion or might see people not wearing masks in places where masks uh, should be worn. Uh, in the spirit of um, collegiality and positive encouragement, uh, whatever we can do to uh, encourage our our friends and colleagues to put on a mask would be greatly appreciated. Quick question for Jess Doty. Uh, is UND offering the booster here on campus? We are at Student Health Services offering the vaccine. Um, I, I like to say we have all three flavors. So we have Moderna, G&J, &G, and Pfizer most, time, most of the time. Um, and you can call the clinic at 777-4500 to schedule your appointment. Um, we're, we're filling up, people are excited to get boosters and so be patient with us, but um, it's available on campus. There's also numerous sites within our community 
Um, so if you go to vaccine.gov, you can find all the sites that are available within Grand Forks and, and the surrounding communities as well um, that have vaccine available. Okay, I see that Donna Smith, our Assistant Vice President for uh, um, Kyle 9 and EOC is here. Thank you, Donna, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, there's a series of questions that, um, you know, are kind of uh, related to the pathway uh, for either the religious or medical exemption and hoping that you can provide a bit more context and color than what we've already talked about. So let's start with one that I've got, which is when a request for an exemption is reviewed, will the person committee simply make a decision based on the justification provided by the employee or will consideration for the employee's role on campus be considered whether or not to grant the waiver? In other words, what factors will be considered in the decision to grant a waiver or not? Kind of a gets right to the question question. Sure, sure. So um, if the request for an exemption is made based on a medical condition or a disability or something like that, we would simply be looking at the support, the supportive um, documentation of the information provided by that individual's medical provider and make a decision based upon that. If the request for an exemption is based upon a um, religious belief, then um, there are a, a couple of questions that the individual will be asked um, to provide some answers to in that, um, in that process. They are um, provide a statement explaining the religious basis for your requested vaccine exception, include the relevant sincerely held religious principles, um, and then we would ask how them to explain how the vaccine would violate or conflict with their sincerely held religious principles. Um, and we would not be questioning the, um, the religious belief or whether they are sincerely held. Um, we will take the individual at their word for that, but then the next, um, so then the next determination is whether there would be an undue hardship created um, if we were to allow that exemption. And so it's, it, there could be a number of fact, factors that could be taken into consideration depending upon um, the end of an individual and their particular situation. Hard to give a blanket answer for that. Well, I think uh, obviously it's a case by case process where you're looking at all the relevant facts. What, and then talk, can you talk a little bit about what, what's, the, what's the healthcare pathway a little bit? Sure, so we have two separate forms and I apologize if some of this was already discussed before I could join. Don't um, worry. But we have um, two separate forms that we will make available for individuals depending upon whether uh, they're asking for a medical or a religious based exception. Um, some medical exceptions could be um, um, could be a disability or a medical condition that prohibits them from getting the getting the vaccine. Um, another condition um, or another situation could be if they are temporarily prohibited from getting the vaccine because of um, um, certain medical factors that are, again, that are temporary. And so what we need from the individual is, and they will be directed through this process when they go um, to apply for the exemption, is some sort of supportive documentation from their physician. And um, we have a form. That is part of the process. You can take the form to your medical provider, have them fill out the form, um, or they could, the medical provider could provide those answers in some other way, but we do need something in writing from the medical provider that you would then upload and that would be reviewed. Thank you. Um, I, actually, I have a, uh, an interesting question also, Donna, if you don't mind. Uh, and this is, uh, we had a discussion about mask mandate. We had a discussion about, you know, what can we do to really encourage people to wear masks? There was a question of like, you know, should we have people saying, hey, put that mask on, put the mask. So people are thinking this through as our community does. And they said, you know, so keeping that in mind, sort of wear that mask, wear that mask. I'm not, that's not actually what we're asking, but we're saying be respectful, you know, et cetera. Would that not be considered harassment in a sense? This is about getting people to wear a mask. What if a student or employee has a medical condition and cannot mask, but is constantly being confronted about wearing one? Any, any thoughts on that? 
It's so again, it's a it's a fact or a case by case kind of really fact dependent scenario. Um, if the situation was um, that many different individuals were asking a person, perhaps a person has a, a an exemption or for some reason can't wear a mask, um, and many separate individuals are asking that person, why aren't you wearing a mask? Put on your mask. Um, that would likely not be considered harassment. But if we had a situation where um, the same individual was continuing to ask the person not wearing the mask and the person not wearing the mask has said, I have an exemption, I can't wear one, whatever the case might be. Um, and they voice that to that individual and they are continuing to ask them about that, um, then it potentially could be harassment depending upon um, the impact on the individual, whether it's severe or pervasive and um, impacts their ability to go to class or, or um, perform their work duties. Thanks. Um, Grand Forks Public School, another question. Uh, Grand Forks Public Schools is transitioning to recommend mass policy. I think that's effective in January, somewhere in that time frame, if I remember correctly. To recommend to recommend mass policy instead of required, when will UND do so? Uh, you know, here we really are dependent upon the CDC's characterization of what level of viral transmission that we're in. Right now, 230s, 250s is where we are. In order to uh, get to a point where I think we would really, you know, say, hey, this feels pretty good about relaxing the mask mandate, we got to get to 50 or below. So that CDC report has to get to 50 or below. How is that possible when we're five times at that level? Get vaccinated, wear masks. I think that's, we actually do have agency to getting to this level if we if we choose to go that route. President Armacost, any, any comments you wanna make there? Just one, and that was, um, that, uh, that threshold was actually amplified in the federal mandate for federal contractors, right? That, um, that uh, for those who aren't vaccinated or not employees, um, there is a requirement that when they come into the federal contractor workplaces that they, they wear masks um, until the transmissib transmissibility levels are to that lower level of 50 cases per 100,000 or lower. Thanks. Thank you. So as you can see, there's not a date. We're talking, you know, there's another question at what date. This isn't date dependent. This is actually when the CDC says, hey, congratulations, you're at a moderate level of transmission, you're at 50 or less, you know, that's when we feel pretty good about, you know, doing what we do. Because I think, honestly, when you think about it, uh, when, we, when we sort of said, hey, let's encourage people to wear masks, but we didn't have a mask mandate, were there a lot of people wearing masks? I don't think there were, you know, and, and so it's kind of on or off sort of a phenomenon to a certain extent. Okay. Um, Yeah, so question, did I hear the vice president correctly? That would have been me. Um, did he say that if an employee falls under the mandate is subsequently vaccinated and suffers a vaccine injury, there's no legal recourse to the injured employee? Nope, that's actually not what I said. The question was, is the university liable? And our understanding from um, the uh, risk manager of the state is no, we are not. That does not mean that uh, employees as individual citizens do not have a pathway. I, I can't comment on that. Um, if a mandate requirement is set for a certain date, will we be given enough time to get both the initial and booster shot? So this is a good question because, you know, what we're seeing, of course, is these mandates have a time that's running. They're, you know, in the early part of January. We're already at December 2nd. To a certain extent, logistically, it's not possible for us to get everybody vaccinated who needs to be vaccinated. But remember, we're taking a different approach here, right? We're basically saying that as the clock, as the contracts that contain the specific language requiring the mask mandate are signed, that's when the clock starts. That's when we notify people. And then we're basically taking on the responsibility, I would dare say the risk, to say, hey, to the federal government, that's when we're gonna start you know, moving this stuff forward and making sure if if the mandate is still in effect, that the people who are directly involved are getting vaccinated. And therefore, you would have logically 
the time you would need in order to be vaccinated, which will be a reasonable period of time. So it pushes back on the specific sort of published mandates for these things. There's a little bit of risk for the university in doing that. I think at this time, that's a risk that we're comfortable with because we know we're moving towards compliance in what we think is an appropriate way and given the uncertainty and fluidity of the situation that we're in. Um, next question. Uh, let's see. Who is liable in the case of adverse reactions then for a forced vaccination? Uh, nobody's forcing anyone to get vaccinated. So uh, if there are additional questions, uh, you know, this is a legal matter, which I don't think we can address here in this meeting. Um, Oh, can we each individually find out if we're gonna be or not included in the mandate so we don't need to wonder worry? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I let me defer to the president just for a second on that question. Yeah, Jed, as, as you pointed out, um, the, the notification of requirement is, um, is really driven by the updates to contracts. And when the contract has the language that requires it. We then make a determination of who's working on the contract or in connection with the contract. So it's really um, contract dependent. I, I think there's you could probably um, reach out through your supervisor or to HR uh, to get a sense. It, it should be pretty clear to people if they're working on a contract directly. It's the indirect that probably uh, causes some uncertainty. And uh, through your supervisor up to HR, uh, we could probably give you a sense of, of of the likelihood of of you being impacted by some contract uh, that contains this language, um, but um, other than that, um, it's kind of a wait and see until until we know which contracts come up for renewal and for um, for the vaccine mandate, uh, we won't know specifically who's impacted. Hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, if a person is request, this is a question for Donna Smith. If a person is requesting a medical waiver, is a simple letter from the healthcare provider enough for documentation? Or will you inquire, require employees to meet with their doctors and incur an extra expense to complete the necessary paperwork? Um, no, they would not need to, generally would not need to meet with their physician if this is something they've been um, treating with their physician for, or the physician is able to you know, provide a, a letter or answer the necessary questions without a visit. That would be my hope. Um, we certainly don't want to require individuals to go and um, you know undertake that expense and the time um, in addition to sometimes it's not real easy to get in to see your physician so um, I would not expect that to be the case in most instances. Thank you. Uh, really an interesting sort of yin and yang question right. I want to thank the staff for letting the appeals court do their thing before you mandate the vaccine. Many are concerned about this mandate and vaccine. The flip side as you've just seen is People are saying, I want to know whether or not I have to do this so I can get going because I'm worried and you know anxious about it. Um, I think, you know, honestly, we're we're taking the course we're taking because we recognize uh, you know, sort of what the gestalt is of our community and our state. But I, I do want to make something, you know, at least speaking for me, and I think for the president as well, we really want people to get vaccinated. We really believe it's the best course. We think people in crowded places should wear masks. We're not backing off on our belief, but we are taking a more selective approach relative to the mandate. And plus the fact that it's such a fluid situation. So um, we're kind of getting to the end. So we're gonna get a couple more questions in maybe, and then I'll turn it over to President Armacost for closing remarks. Um, when, oh, interesting. When could faculty expect that staff and colleagues will be back in their offices for work? Uh, ABP Barberg, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I did answer that question in the chat, but um, essentially that's up to um, individual departments and divisions. So there may be folks who will continue to work um, a hybrid um, type of situation or, or uh, work remotely 100%. So um, if they have questions about persons in their specific area, then uh, they can certainly speak to um, you know, leadership in that area or in the division. Thank you. Uh, a flip side question, assuming the executive order isn't enjoined, uh, employees working in a covered contract or workplace, but not working on or in connection with a covered man, con with a covered contract or covered by the vaccine requirement, correct? No, 
That's not the way that we're interpreting it. As I said, we, we are not assuming that upon the signing of a initial contract that the entire campus is implicated in the mandate. So that is the tack that we are taking at this time. And we think that it's consistent with a reasonable interpretation of what's been published. So um, let's see. Um, ah, uh, is, if my UND department is having a non-mandatory group social function off campus, should we A, discourage this activity or B, require masks for those UND employees attending? Uh, I'm kind of assuming this is really becomes, even though it's sort of people that work together, it's a private function. Uh, so Peggy, do you want to just comment on that briefly? Yeah, I would agree um, that these are private functions outside of work. Um, a person is making a personal decision to attend it. It's not supported by the university in any way. Then these are personal decisions that folks have to make. Just like uh, I mean, you know, it's a social function, I get it, but it's just like if you would go to a restaurant to eat or anything like that where others are um, in, in attendance and, and um, masks are not mandated. Okay, uh, I think we've got, I'm just trying to see if I can pick one more question. Um, ah, Peggy. If UND will require employees to be vaccinated and that employee tests positive for COVID, will that employee have to use their vacation time for the time they have to be isolated? Yes, they do. Um, there's nothing in the mandate that talks about actually getting COVID, um, testing positive, getting ill, those kinds of things. They would still need to use um, the available leave, either sick or annual leave. Um, the coverage is only for um, if they get vaccinated during the course of their workday. And again, please make sure that you work with your supervisors about that time off. Um, and uh, also if they were to have a side effect that would keep them away from work, um, that would be where uh, they would not have to use sick leave. And last question, uh, are faculty and or administrators allowed to ask faculty if they're vaccinated? We have not encouraged that all along. Um, so I think we, unless a member of EC President uh, Armacost want to speak differently, I think that's, we still stay that, that course. Okay, thank you. Uh, President, we really got, we're on to our last minute. So President Armacost, uh, closing comments? Closing comments, thanks. And I uh, appreciate all the great inputs from the team. Thanks to everybody for dialing in with uh, your great questions. Uh, a lot of uncertainty around this particular issue. And uh, I appreciate the insights that you're giving just by asking those questions. We'll make sure that we get answers posted uh, to the website um, as well, so that you, if we didn't have a chance to answer your question, you'll at least see um, our answer online. Um, just uh, there are a number of questions about comparing us to NDSU. Um, Dean Bershani, President Bershani, and I talk about these things all the time, along with other issues. And um, and uh, initially, they had a very similar approach to us, kind of a let's take it patient and slow. And then just last week, they issued a campus-wide mandate for all employees, including student employees. Um, that was their decision based on the information they have and the contracts that they have. Um, we're, we, we are likely in a, a different situation than them, even though the same political pressures and the same um, same same state legal readings are, are, are what they are. Um, however, the timing of our contracts and the discussions that we've had with our prime contractors um, lead us to this um, kind of patient approach as we move through uh, the requirement for vaccinations. We will do our very best to, to keep you posted on how things are moving. Um, we will, um, there are some great questions about, can I, um, can I enter my information now, even though I haven't been called up for mandatory vaccination? We'll discuss that in the meeting that we have in just a few minutes with the entire team. Um, but, uh, but again, we, we wanna make good decisions for the university. We wanna keep health and safety at the forefront. Let me again, strongly encourage everybody to get vaccinated, um, but we also don't wanna jump the gun because um, I think, uh, I don't want to be in a situation where somebody gets vaccinated only to learn uh, to satisfy the mandate, only to have the mandate undone. I don't think that would be fair to those people either. So thank you all for being here uh, to my team. Thank you for your great leadership and your, your wise counsel all along the way. Have a great day, everybody.